Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday and welcome. Merry Christmas as well. Uh, I want to say thank you to Brandon for our scripture reading this morning. Uh, and even just hearing him read that, don't you just think, man, I know that story. Uh, and even as he's reading, even if you're not looking at the Bible, your mind just fills in the blanks and wants to finish it, even as he's saying it. Uh, you know, the story of the birth of Christ is one that is supremely well known. Uh, but just as much as it's known, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions uh, and a lot of myths surrounding the story of Christ's birth, uh, surrounding Christmas. Uh, now, Christmas is a great time of year. Uh, you know, thinking about myself personally, uh, I love winter time. Uh, I always hope for a white Christmas. Don't always get it, but I always hope for one. Uh, I love to be able to spend time with family, uh, to sit around and eat good food, uh, to, to see their face when they open the presents that we pick out for them, and to be able to get some presents as well. It's a very exciting time. Uh, for many people, I think Christmas is, uh, like the song says, the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, favorite season, a favorite holiday. Uh, but for others, we need to realize Christmas can be a difficult time of year. Uh, you know, maybe Christmas especially could cause some to feel uh, loneliness, uh, remembering Christmas has passed, uh, remembering those who have passed on. Uh, and I believe it ought to be said that we have an obligation uh, and a responsibility to look to these people, uh, to lift them up, to reach out to them, uh, to comfort and encourage them. Uh, but for many Christians, I think Christmas can be a confusing time. Uh, you know, it's great to see people have a focus on Jesus when normally throughout the rest of the year, they just don't. Uh, but at the same time, you start to hear these things being said about Christ, and you wonder, uh, you know, is that really right? Uh, is that really true? Uh, Christmas can be very confusing. Uh, if you've ever been to or, or heard of these Christmas pageants uh, and different plays that go on, uh, there are several things that you might witness there, and you say, well, uh, you know, is that really the way the Bible tells it? Uh, and I think maybe born out of these events and others, uh, the Christmas story may get confused. Uh, but like we said, this is one that we feel like we know pretty well. Uh, you know, Luke chapter 2, and it seems like every year we open up to this portion of our Bible, uh, and it's always just as we expect it to be, no surprises at all. Uh, and you've heard it told and, and retold uh, time and time again. Uh, the story normally goes something like this. Uh, it was about 2,000 years ago. Uh, it was the evening of December 25th, and Mary and Joseph ride into Bethlehem. Mary's on the donkey, and she's urgently needing to give birth uh, that very night. But as they come into Bethlehem, all the innkeepers turn them away rudely, uh, and they deliver Jesus in a stable. Uh, we know that angels sing to the shepherds, and then three kings on three camels come and worship the newborn infant Jesus. Uh, now that's normally how we hear it told, but that's almost entirely wrong. Uh, or at least, that's almost entirely not from the Bible. It's from man's invention. Uh, and especially when we start to see these tellings and retellings of the Christmas story, uh, we see that the focus has shifted much more to drama, much more to inciting the emotions of the people who may be attending or hearing this, and much less toward what the Holy Scriptures actually have to say. Uh, of course, the only accurate account about what happened at the birth of Jesus is found in the Bible. Uh, and I want to lay out some of these Christmas myths for us this morning and understand before we even start the list, uh, some of these details are crucially important. Uh, others that we're going to mention are not important at all. Uh, a lot of these that we'll mention are small details. But what I want us to realize is there's some things that we are so sure about that are actually not found in the Bible at all. You see, the problem is too often what people believe is based on what they've always heard. It's not based on what they've read in the Bible, not based on what the Holy Scriptures have to say. Uh, so this morning, let's look at what the Bible reveals uh, and examine some Christmas myths. Uh, the first one that we'll mention, Mary rode into Bethlehem on a donkey. Uh, now, of course, we'll look to Luke chapter 2. This is where the account is found in the Bible. Uh, and it's common knowledge, and it's always portrayed, uh, portrayed in this way. You've seen it uh, in Christmas cards, even. The illustration there uh, shows Mary coming in on a donkey, and we're sure that this happened. But here's all that's said in the Bible. Luke 2, verse 3 to verse 5. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. 
Now, was it possible that Mary rode on a donkey? Of course. That's a possibility. Uh, certainly, it, it could have been that way. But does the Bible tell us she rode on a donkey? It doesn't. Uh, wouldn't it be just as likely that she was riding on a camel? Or perhaps she was riding on a horse? Or perhaps she was in a cart being pulled by some animal? Or perhaps she walked? Uh, we simply don't know. The Bible doesn't reveal that fact to us. Uh, you know, there are, are many possibilities. Uh, the Bible doesn't choose to, to tell us how she got to Bethlehem. It only says she came with Joseph to Bethlehem, uh, this city of David. Uh, now again, as we said at the outset, some of these details are crucially important. Some of them are small. But I want us to examine the line of thinking that is so ingrained in society. You know, these are details in the story of Jesus that we're sure of. Things that we just know, and if we were being quizzed before a heavenly host with true or false questions, Mary rode into Bethlehem on a donkey, true or false? There are a lot of people who say, true, I know that. But the Bible doesn't say. Uh, we need to always have this certainty when it comes to any matter uh, of God's Word, especially when it comes to the Messiah. Uh, what does the Bible actually say and what has man said? Uh, we need to treat what man has said appropriately. Treat it as the Word of man and treat what God has said appropriately, treat it as the Holy Scripture. Uh, now let's look at the second one, myth number two. Jesus was born the same night that Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem. Uh, and this is part of adding drama to the story. Normally when it's told, uh, Mary is urgently in need of giving birth. This is an emergency situation. They have to find a place because she's ready to deliver right now. Uh, well again, what does the Bible say? In Luke chapter 2 and verse 6, we find this, these words. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Now does that sound like an emergency situation where they just barely got in in time and then the baby was born? Uh, it certainly doesn't sound like that. Uh, now again, you could say, well, maybe it was the case, uh, but what does the Bible say? Uh, what does the Scripture lay out for us? Uh, they could have arrived, uh, you know, up to weeks earlier, before the time of the birth. Uh, God's Word simply states that while they were there, the days were accomplished or the days were completed uh, for her to be delivered. You know, arriving in town uh, well before her, her due date would make more sense, I think, as it's laid out in the Scriptures. Uh, we have to be very, very careful about trying to imprint our own ideas onto God's Word. Uh, if you've seen many of the, the popular movies or even TV specials that try to depict the events of Luke chapter 2, uh, there are many places where inescapably man has to make some decisions. Uh, because just like so many other stories in the Bible, we aren't given every detail. Uh, and when we're not given every detail, man fills in the holes, and sometimes the things that man has supplied is what we remember and what we hold close to our heart as if it's Scripture. We have to be very careful about this. Let me mention briefly as well the story of Moses. Uh, now this is one that has been popularized in films and on TV uh, for years and years and years. Uh, and it is shocking how many Christians can remember minute details from these films and yet they can't remember what's actually said there on the page in the book of Exodus. And of course you know, I don't have to tell you, many of the things depicted on films and, and on TV uh, are not found in the Bible. Uh, so be very careful with this idea. Uh, the idea that she gave birth the same night uh, in an urgent emergency situation, uh, it's simply not recorded for us in the Bible. Uh, now myth number three, and this one I think is important. An innkeeper turned away Joseph and Mary. Uh, and if you've seen one of these Christmas pageants, this is a key role. Uh, you know, this is a villain that's played, uh, portrayed oftentimes, and it's very important who's going to play the innkeeper this year. Uh, well, would you be surprised to find out there's not even an innkeeper mentioned in the biblical account? And you would say, well, look in verse 7, and I see an inn. Well, let's talk about the inn. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 7, it says, She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Uh, now, immediately, we ought to say there's no mention of an innkeeper. And no mention of someone personally, verbally telling them, no, Mary and Joseph, you can't stay here. And so that, that whole drama has been invented by man. That's not in the text. Uh, and this is the only place we see this detail described. Uh, but it does say there was no room for them in the inn. Uh, 
And to better understand what's being said here, we look to the original language of this passage. Uh, the Greek word here used for in is kataluma. Uh, and the literal meaning is the breaking up of a journey. Uh, that is a lodging place, a guest chamber, or an inn. Uh, it comes from the words that mean to loosen down or to halt for a night. Uh, so this is a stopping place. Uh, and as we'll see, uh, you know, this doesn't have to mean in as we might think of it. Uh, it could simply be a guest chamber or a guest room in someone else's house. Uh, you know, there are only two other times in the entire New Testament that we see this word used. And I want to look at them briefly with you. Uh, it's the same account from different Gospels. Uh, in Mark 14 and verse 14, it says, Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is the guest room? in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And that's kataluma. That's our word in from Luke 2. Here it's translated as gestro. And then Luke 22 and verse 11, his account of the gospel records the same instance. Uh, you say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Uh, we need to be very careful too, not just about inserting our own ideas into the story, but inserting our own ideas about the words that the story chooses to use. Uh, you know, when we hear in, are we thinking about the Ramada Inn? Uh, you know, are we thinking about a Super 8 motel? Uh, we have this idea of a, a Bible Times hotel where they stopped over, but they were turned away, no vacancy. Uh, is that the picture that's presented in the Bible? Uh, you know, one of the issues is translation. And like we said, Cataluma can mean different things. It can mean a guest room. It can mean an inn. Uh, one reference book that I like to use is called Young's Literal Translation of the Bible. Uh, and as he translates from Greek to English, he makes no effort to clean it up or to rearrange the words to try and make it sound nice for English readers or to try and make it easier to read on the page. I want you to hear this verse from his translation. Again, this is Luke 2.7 from the 1898 Young's Literal Translation. Uh, he says, And she brought forth her son, the firstborn, and wrapped him up, and laid him down in the manger, because there was not for them a place in the guest chamber. Uh, and as he makes his attempt to move from the Greek to the English, uh, he really doesn't try to make it fit. And you can even see it there. There was not for them a place. Uh, it's kind of jarring to read it like that because he hasn't changed the word order. Well, in the same way, he took the most basic meaning of this word, Cataluma, uh, he put guest chamber. Uh, and many people have suggested, and I think it, it holds weight, that as they came to Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph probably went to their relatives. You remember the reason they had to come to Bethlehem is because Joseph was of that lineage of the house of David. And so they would go to Bethlehem, they would go to their nearest relatives there, and they said, I'm sorry, Mary and Joseph, our guest rooms are all full. Uh, we're full here, we don't have room for you in this guest room, uh, but there is a place where you can stay, and of course there's going to be a place where Mary can give birth to her son. Uh, now we come back to the myth and to the question, did Joseph or, or Mary talk to any innkeepers? Uh, maybe, uh, perhaps, but the Bible certainly does not say that they did. The Bible does not mention an innkeeper. The Bible does not mention him turning them away, uh, telling them they cannot stay there for any reason. Uh, although innkeepers play a prominent part uh, in many retellings of the birth of Christ and Christmas pageants, no innkeeper is actually mentioned in the Scripture. Uh, and like we said, many scholars think it's more likely they stayed with relatives, and this word is just meaning uh, a guest room. Uh, so that's our third myth, the innkeeper. Myth number four, and this is one that may shock you, uh, Jesus was born in a stable. And this is another one where if, if I was quizzing you and if we had this all laid out before us, true or false, uh, Jesus was born in a stable, I think we would mostly put true. We say, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but again, the Bible doesn't say that. Uh, it's often depicted this way. Uh, nativities especially are going to show some form of a stable and say, well, this is where Christ was born. Uh, does the Bible say this? Again, we look to verse 7. Uh, Luke 2, verse 7, She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Uh, was Jesus born in a stable? Was he born in a barn? Was he born in a cave? Uh, the Bible simply doesn't say. The Bible doesn't mention any of these places in connection with Christ's birth. The only thing mentioned is a manger. Uh, scripture simply reports that they laid baby Jesus in a manger because there was no room for them in the, the inn or the guest room. Uh, and so we have to ask, what is a manger? 
And that seems the, the natural follow-up, the question to ask. Uh, well, the word manger seems to denote a stall uh, or a crib of some sort that would be used, a trough, uh, for feeding cattle. Uh, and in the Greek, we can see this idea uh, would even be used to refer to a ledge, uh, either a projection or even an indention in the wall, uh, so that the travelers could put food for their animals there. Uh, now, this could be in a stable, but it could also be part of this guest room. Uh, it could also be on the outside wall of the house. It could also be behind the house where you would often see a place for the weary traveler to come in under some sort of covering, some sort of protection. Uh, now, I know it seems like at this point, aren't we being especially critical and trying to split hairs on this issue? Uh, but for us to be so sure to say he was born in a stable, and the Bible does not mention this, uh, that's something that I believe ought to worry us, for us to be so sure of something, and yet it's not there in the text. Uh, could it have been a stable where this manger was? Absolutely. Uh, but I wouldn't want us to say we know definitively that it is, because it isn't necessarily. Uh, myth number five, and this is a popular one to talk about, uh, the three kings, or sometimes called the three wise men, who came to worship the baby Jesus. Uh, now this is one that especially is seen in nativities, in Christmas pageants, on Christmas cards, on TV, and in movies. Uh, this is a popular scene to depict. Uh, now, we don't find any mention of kings or wise men in Luke chapter 2, but we do see wise men mentioned in Matthew chapter 2, uh, in his account of the gospel, and his account of the birth of Christ. First, in Matthew 2, if you look at verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And this word for wise men, this is magi. Uh, the singular of that word is magus. Uh, and this doesn't always have to talk about someone who's practicing sorcery or witchcraft. Uh, it means an enlightened one. Uh, we see a similar term used to describe soothsayers and advisors to kings in the Old Testament. Uh, if you look in verse 11 of Matthew 2, it says, When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. They presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, now, like we said, a popular scene, and we're familiar with this imagery, but go back to the myth and ask yourself the question, uh, did three kings or wise men riding camels come to Jesus' birth? Uh, well, first off, there's no mention of kings. They're, they're called magi. They're called wise men. Uh, there's no mention of camels, and there's no mention of the number three. Now, a lot of people look and say, well, there's three gifts, so there must have been three wise men. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, we have mentioned three gifts specifically that they presented to him, uh, but it could have been two wise men. We know it's plural, so it wasn't one. It could have been a great number of wise men who choose to show these three gifts, present them uh, to Jesus. Uh, but also, you'll notice they're not here uh, at the birth of Jesus. They're not coming to see, uh, you know, infant baby Jesus. Uh, and as we look at this, this event, it's important to note, Scripture calls Jesus uh, a child at this point. Uh, scripture does not refer to him as a baby or as an infant. Uh, and the original language will bear this out. It's a different term used. The term for child, not the term for infant. Uh, by the way, there's also no proof to show what country these wise men might have come from. And people in popular opinion uh, have tried to put forward different ones that they're sure they came from. Uh, but on this idea of child, look at uh, Matthew 2 and verse 13. Matthew 2.13 says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Uh, this is just after the wise men have come. Just after the gifts have been presented, they worship Jesus, and then they're departing. And that scene, just after that, in verse 13, it describes Jesus as a young child, which again is not the same term uh, used for baby or infant. And so we would ask, naturally, so how old is Jesus at this point? How long after his birth is this? How old is the child? Well, based on the calculations of King Herod and of the Magi, uh, Jesus could have been two years old uh, or under that age. 
Uh, if you look in verse 16, Matthew 2, 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, and notice this, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Uh, using the, the information that he had gathered from the wise men in their first meeting, uh, he figured out he could be as old as two. And so it's very likely that the wise men uh, didn't come to the birth, didn't come and see infant baby Jesus, uh, but came to two-year-old Jesus, or one-and-a-half Jesus. Uh, notice also there's, there's no mention, like we said, of camels, not of the number three, uh, not of any names. And this astounds me, but tradition puts forward names for the so-called three wise men. Uh, Gaspar, Balthazar, and Melchior. Uh, and different cultures have different names, but they present for them. But you have to say, isn't this astounding how little the Bible will record about this meeting with the wise men, and yet how much man presents and we hold to be true. Uh, we need to be very careful again about this idea. Uh, now the last myth that we'll talk about this morning. Myth number six, Jesus was born on December 25th. Uh, Christmas, isn't it, after all, the birthday of Jesus? Uh, well, again, this is something where the Bible doesn't say. And it's worth mentioning the Bible also doesn't command us uh, or even indicate that we should try and keep the birth of Christ as a holy day and a day to give special commemoration to Him that we wouldn't normally do throughout the rest of the year. Uh, but we look to what the Scripture says. In Luke 2, in verse 1, it says, It came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Uh, now, different translations will either say registered or enrolled or taxed. Uh, but it was necessary, and it's clear from the context, that with this registry, people would have to go back to their place of origin. That's why we see Joseph and Mary go back to Bethlehem in order by their cities, uh, he's from the lineage of David. It was necessary to number the people to keep track of them uh, so that they could be taxed, but also to have an accurate record of the people. Uh, now, the Bible does not specify uh, a day, a month, uh, a date of any sort. Uh, but one thing that we can know, it would be difficult to travel in Judea in December. Uh, and so for that reason, perhaps it would be unlikely that the census would be taken then and that they would require everyone to go back and make these long journeys during this time of year. Uh, now, as soon as I say that, I know someone says, but the Roman government doesn't care. Uh, the Roman government doesn't mind inconveniencing these people. Okay, I agree with that. Uh, but there's another way that we might say December 25th would be unlikely. If you look in Luke 2 and verse 8, it says, Now they, they, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Uh, again, this isn't impossible that this would be December, uh, but it's highly unlikely. Uh, you wouldn't expect to see shepherds in this region uh, abiding in the field or living out in the fields at this time of year. Uh, the fields were unproductive during December. You wouldn't see great grazing uh, for their flocks. Uh, the normal practice in this culture, in this part of the world, was to keep the flocks in the field from spring until autumn. Uh, and as you start to see the end of autumn and the oncome of winter, uh, they would bring them uh, no longer living out in the fields, but bring them back. Uh, now, this issue of dating the birth of Christ is one that people have uh, spent so much time on. Uh, I've seen great work done where you try and connect the birth of John the Baptist uh, Christ's cousin with the birth of Christ. And from the, the time we see uh, John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, finish his time in the temple, uh, you space out to see when he was born and understanding the conception of Christ following nine months to his birth. Uh, people have done way too much work on this, in my opinion. Uh, but to go back to the idea of the myth, does the Bible tell us Jesus was born December 25th? Uh, no, it doesn't. Now, here's the point that I really want to talk about with all of these put together. Uh, and I know you, you may have got a little exhausted with me trying to split some of these hairs. Uh, but there are so many things about the birth of Christ that we're confident about, uh, that we're sure of, and yet we open the Bible and it's not there. Now let me ask you this question and think honestly with yourself. If the popular telling of Christ's birth differs from the Holy Scripture in so many ways, then is it possible that details have been added, deleted, or changed 
about Christ's life or about His death or about His resurrection? What about His teaching and the design for the salvation of mankind? There are a lot of things that are told. There are a lot of things that are popular opinion and there's a lot of things that society just knows. And you quiz them on it and they're ready to say, yeah, that's a sure thing. But if they opened up their Bible looking for these things which they're so sure of, many of them would not be found. It's the way that we view Jesus. And it's the way that we view the Bible. Are we looking to His Word as we ought to? Uh, Do we have the respect for the Scriptures that we ought to? I know, especially during this time of year, we see amazing faith from people who are not ashamed to mention the name of Jesus Christ. And I love that. I really do, believe me. But I would hate for Christians who are wearing that name so proudly to be so reckless and so haphazard with the Bible. The very first thing that any follower of God ought to do is to lay their teaching up for examination. To say, I want you to check in God's Word whether the things that I'm saying are true. And if they're not, I need to know about it. And that's the same way that I would present any lesson to you. And you know that. The life that we live is a lesson. Uh, You've heard people talk about rather seeing a sermon instead of hearing it. Uh, Well, we are all preaching in the name of Jesus Christ by the example that we lay out. Is it something that comes from popular opinion and the additions of man, or is it something that comes from Scripture? Uh, I would hope that we would be the most careful of all to be sure that we're in line with God's Word. Not veering off to the right or the left, not adding things for the sake of drama, not deleting things for the space of time, but to always say, where God's Word speaks... That's where I want to speak and not hold anything back, but the whole counsel and every bit of it. And where God's Word doesn't give a detail or doesn't give us as much as our curiosity might like, let's not go there. Let's not try and plug that in because, sad though it may be, people might remember those details added by man and forget or neglect the Holy Word of God. Now, of course, the reason that we are so focused on Christ, not just today, but throughout every day of our lives, is because salvation is only through Him. Uh, The way Peter said it, there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. If you are not yet a Christian this morning, the opportunity is available to you to have your sins washed away and forgiven. And what a beautiful statement that is, that the remission of sins is possible, but it's only through Jesus, through coming to Him and submitting to His will to be obedient to His teaching for our life, which of course we find in the Bible. And if you are a Christian, maybe you've wandered back into sin. Uh, Rest assured that there is a way back to God. There is a way to have that sin removed, to come to the Lord who is ready to forgive, and together we can serve Him with our all. We can respect Him and respect His holy commandments given in God's Word. If there's anything that we can do to assist you this morning, we would invite you to come as together we stand and sing.